All right, we're all set. Uh, hi, my name is Kate Lewis. I'm a first year MBA student and I'm very excited to uh, introduce the sponsored lunch. We have the sports, business, analytics, and ticketing case studies from the pros and it's by our sponsor, Ticketmaster Live Analytics. Today we have John Fariz from Live Analytics, Kenny Farrell from the Arizona Diamondbacks, and Anthony Perez from the Orlando Magic. And so uh, let's begin. Okay, thanks. I uh, apologize for the delay. Um, luckily, we're at MIT, so if we had a crack team of uh, technical folks on the AV side that got it fixed. Um, so my name is John Furies. I um, run a group called Live Analytics. It's a division within Ticketmaster, and uh, this conference has a special place in my heart because we actually launched this division two years ago at the MIT conference. And it's been uh, just great coming to this conference and seeing how much bigger it's gotten every year. Uh, this room is probably four times bigger than the room we, we presented in last year and like eight times bigger than the room from, from two years ago. So uh, the fact that the conference is really branching into more of the sports business side and uh, expanding from doing more than just, you know, how much is Carmelo Anthony worth in the draft and should I make him drive to the left versus the right, which is really the roots of the conference. It's now getting into issues like, you know, how to sell more tickets and, and um, a lot of back and front office stuff. So. My group really has um, a simple charter. Uh, <coughs> we are trying to help our clients, which are the sports teams, the venues, uh, I'm just gonna keep going, uh, the artists, the teams, uh, get a 360 degree view, as holistic a view as possible, of the live event fan, that consumer, as well as the events. And by providing a deep set of data, really understand who they are, what they like, how to communicate to them. And there's three, uh, sort of differentiators or parts to our value proposition. First, uh, Ticketmaster sits on an incredible data asset, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a follow-on slide. Uh, secondly, we uh, can bring a, a set of resources and expertise. It's very hard for an individual team to justify having a PhD in statistics. They will have a lot of good stuff for that person to do for maybe a month or two, but they really don't have a year's worth of business for them. And so what you see, you see this across the leagues now, um, as well as what Ticketmaster's doing, we can bring that staff on and amortize it across a much wider client base, and we can also share best practices across everyone. And then there's a third piece to the, to the proposition here, which is the least uh, sexy part of it all, but is just the data, getting the data in and out of uh, the team's systems, making sense of it, deduping it, standardizing it, normalizing it, that plumbing is actually probably the hardest part of all of this. It's the least interesting, but the slinging of the data, you can't really do anything without that. And, and in fact, Kenny's gonna talk a little bit about those challenges and, and how important that is for CRM. In terms of what we apply that to, it's sort of oversimplified to those four boxes. What we are helping our clients do um, falls into those categories. So one is acquisition. Just help me find people that wanna to go to these events. Help me find the fans. Where are they? How do I, what channels do I use to talk to them? And then secondly, of my fans, the ones you've helped me find, the existing fans, how do I target prospect segment within that group? What's, what's the right way to group them, communicate to them, give them tailored, targeted messages at the right time? Third piece, uh, we talk to a lot of fans just to do primary research, consumer insights, uh, a lot of that. We'll talk to 200,000 fans uh, where we'll send out surveys and just ask them about trends, satisfaction levels. We focus heavily now on digital ticketing, mobile, social. That, those are sort of the key trends and how technology fits into those things and impacts ticketing. And then the last piece, which is a really important one, is pricing. What's the right way to price this ticket? We really want to help the teams, our clients, get that ticket price right initially, get the scaling correct, and then give them tools around dynamic pricing once they've gone on sale. So I mentioned the data. Um, when this group was started, there was a realization Ticketmaster had a lot of data and was doing next to nothing with it. And we really should think of ourselves as a data company as well as a ticketing company and apply that data for insights as well as for, for marketing. And so this just gives you an idea of, of what we're talking about. Uh, these are all annualized numbers. So um, we do about 100,000 events that will be ticketed over the course of the year. So think about that footprint and being able to use that and see the transactions. We processed about 150 million sports tickets. Uh, we're also doing concerts, uh, arts and theater, family events. 
We're the number three e-commerce site on the web. Um, it's actually a pretty high purchase price if you think about it when you buy tickets to a live event. And then we've got 26 million, upwards of 26 million people that are touching us uh, each month on the website where we can interact with them. And, and all that leads to a very large database. Globally, we've got about 200 million unique records where we have insights into those records in terms of what they buy. In the US, that's about 100 million. So uh, a very rich database that we can apply. And so, you know, why are we here? Why does all this matter? I, the, the next two slides, I think, really simplify what the challenge is here and what the opportunity is. Um, so why does the data matter? Well, there's still a lot of empty seats. Um, this is just the Ticketmaster footprint. So this is not the whole industry. But uh, our estimates are about 25, 26% of seats are actually empty. And if you think about a seat, that's spoiled inventory. Once the event has happened and that seat was empty, you can never go back and, and get that revenue. That, that's a lost opportunity. So you're talking about 50 million sports tickets where there was an empty seat. Uh, and if you want to uh, think about that from a dollar's perspective, at the face value of those tickets, and granted, their pricing may have been the reason they didn't sell, but it also could have been awareness. Um, that's $900 million in uncaptured revenue. So if the industry can just capture 10 or 20% of that, you're talking about hundred, you know, hundreds of million dollars, uh, millions of dollars that can drop to the bottom line and, and make the industry much more profitable, much healthier. This second one is, is also somewhat staggering. So um, you guys probably know there's something called the secondary market uh, where people resell tickets. Uh, our estimate, it's hard to really get your arms around how big this is, uh, and this number is actually a year old now, but uh, it's about a three to four billion dollar industry uh, of, uh, on, on the backs of teams uh, and artists where the ticket's just getting resold, just being arbitraged. And about 70%, you know, almost three quarters of that is sports. So if you think about that, that's a couple billion dollars right there that is really money that brokers uh, and scalpers are taking that uh, some portion of that the team should be getting. So this is kind of the requisite slide where we just show a lot of the clients. Uh, in the last two years since we launched, we've probably done about 300 unique projects um, and about across about 150 unique clients. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very lucky, honored to have a couple of our clients here. They're going to talk about some of the, the tools we've given them. They're going to focus on things like prospecting, segmenting. Uh, I'm going to give uh, just three quick slides that are case studies, uh, teams that are not up here with us, to just give you a sample of some of the other work that we've done. So this first one, and I apologize for the people over in, in that corner in terms of viewing this, but um, this gets back to that issue that I was talking about the secondary market and brokers. So this is something we did with a major league baseball team that essentially said to us, we know we have a lot of brokers and we think that they're actually coordinating some of their activities with each other. Can you help us get to the bottom of how these brokers are interacting? And so we had a lot of data of ticket purchasing, uh, these emails, and then the forwarding of those tickets to other accounts, and then on the secondary, the, the retail accounts all pulled together and being, being then uh, sold out to end consumers. And we decided to grab social networking software. Uh, it's actually software that's used, um, its history is in terrorist rings and um, crime families, uh, and figuring out those relationships, who's talking to who, who's affiliated. I'm not drawing any conclusions about, um, about or by guilt by association here. But what you have in this case is every one of these is actually a network of multiple account buyers that are actually affiliated and is a broker ring. Um, and so the blue, each of those little blue circles is someone that's buying from this NL, MLB team. The size of the circle is how many tickets they're buying. So you have a lot of cases where you have these little blue circles and then they're all feeding into the orange, and the size of the orange is how many tickets are then being sold on secondary. And so we kind of broke this down. There were about 90 of these rings. Uh, a couple of them, the, the top ring was actually grossing a couple million dollars uh, of resale activity at a crazy margin. I think it was about a 70% margin. A couple of the rings were actually losing money. Uh, but the important part here was for the team, this did a few things. One is it finally got to the bottom of a bunch of what seemed like unique individual accounts. And you, you could actually go after the fact and look at the emails and you would realize that these were kind of fake emails that they, they had set up that were affiliated with the account. But it let the team be much more efficient in managing these guys. They could say, look, we understand you're actually 
you, you, you're pretending you're 20 people, but you're actually one. And it's much more efficient if I communicate and manage you as that one person. And then it also let them get on top of a lot of the gaming that was going on with incentives uh, on the resale activity. There's, there's benefits to being a season ticket holder. And this let them really understand uh, if I'm going to give you extra ticket allocations and stuff, am I dealing with one person, am I dealing with a reef fan, or am I dealing with a broker, and how big that ring is. Uh, the second one was something we did with the NFL. So uh, Anthony's going to talk about dynamic pricing. The NFL right now as a league does not, um, does not do variable pricing, which is to have the same seat have a different price for, for different games, or dynamic pricing, which is changing the seat price uh, after you've gone on sale based on changes in popularity or, or changes in uh, any of the dynamics. So for the NFL, it's especially important. Their main lever is the scaling of the venue, how you set up those price points, and then uh, secondly, just what you set those price points at. And so the initial pricing becomes all important uh, for them. This was an exercise we did with the team where we took a bunch of variables. We relied on uh, attendance levels. We also lo looked at what was happening on the secondary market, how much stuff was being posted. Uh, we went around the stadium and ranked seat sections uh, in terms of seat quality around all that and created, uh, it's hard to get the absolute level modeled, um, but created a relative ranking of all the sections that gave you kind of a price value concept. And what we found here is that um, those red lines are the relative value based on all the data the bars were what the prices were actually set at by the team. And so a couple things jumped out. One was club relative to the other sections actually seemed a little overpriced. Um, a very good opportunity on the lower bowl, that, that third section across. And also some opportunities in the lower bowl. If you look at those first two bars, those are actually the same price point, but you had a very good opportunity to actually split that into two price points uh, and scale further around that so that you could be charging more for one of the sections in the lower bowl. The final thing we saw uh, just on, on that top part was that the upper bowl had a bunch of price points, but there wasn't a big differential in value across those price points. So they didn't want to add more and more price points, and so we were able to collapse a few in the upper bowl and then expand a few in the lower bowl. And then there was one uh, other cool thing that we did on this, which was we looked just row by row in a couple of the sections to get an idea. Obviously, the front row is worth more than the back row. But what we found was different uh, steepness of that fall off across these sections. And so, and I don't think we expected this or would have guessed this going in, but the end zone actually is much steeper fall off. And so what some teams will do is they'll price the first row or the first two rows a little bit higher or they'll do a split in the middle or they'll do no, no difference on all of this. In this case, the team wasn't doing a split. They were contemplating doing a split right at the halfway point. And what we found, especially in the end zone, was those first five or six rows were really valuable, and then it kind of flattened off. And so that would be the best place to put that break point. It kind of makes sense if you think about the, the uh, wasn't Green Bay, but that Lambo Leaf concept, where if you're in the end zone section, you actually can feel in the first few rows like you're really in the middle of the action. And so uh, what was exciting about this was it actually changed, uh, led to a bunch of changes in the scaling of the venue as well as their price points. OK, last one for me, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to the pros, as I said in, in this. Um, so this is an interesting one because it marries together sports and concerts. And uh, we have a team, uh, one of the basketball teams, that is deciding what acts to bring in. And one of the things they want to take into account is, let me bring in a performer that's going to really resonate with my single ticket holders, that, that base. One of the benefits of being a season ticket holder, especially for, a team, for teams that own the venue, is that you can give inst the sort of preferred access to those tickets when a concert comes to town. And so by looking across our database, we can score every consumer and get an affinity for different artists based on lookalikes, what artists they've gone to, this artist is similar to that artist. And what you see here is the further you are to the right on that uh, season plan buyer, the further you go to the right, the, the higher the percentage of the fans are that have an affinity to that artist. And, so, and then the, the other axis is kind of their, their overall popularity. So not surprisingly, Bruce Springsteen looks like a great artist to get. But then you see that that would actually be a much better choice um, than Dave Matthews Band, also a well-known, just doesn't resonate with the fan base as well. And, and you would not want to book Drake, for example, if your goal here was to have an artist that the season ticket holders really loved. The other part of this, which is on the right, is just a comparison. It's, it's the same concept, but here we just show in a spider chart where you could segment different people that are coming into the venue. And so in this case, the further you are from the center, the higher your affinity is to that artist. And we just do a quick comparison where we would show 
here's what your season ticket holders look like. Now let me show you what single buyers are. Let me show you anyone else who came in the venue but not for basketball. And then finally, other people that were in the local community that go to live events but that had never actually stepped into that venue. So that could be interesting if you're trying to broaden the, the base of consumers that were coming in. So that's it for me. I'm going to pass it over to Kenny Farrell uh, with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, he's going to talk specifically about what the Diamondbacks are doing with uh, CRM and analytics. Um, I've been with the Diamondbacks for about 15 years. Uh, my background initially was coming up through ticket operations. Um, in the last five years, I've moved more towards the analytics side, uh, focusing on ticket pricing, uh, ticket sales, and CRM. Uh, we've been working with Live Analytics for two years, uh, using their prospect model for the first time this season. And so what I want to be able to do is kind of walk you through a little bit of ultimately how uh, data and how we're structuring data, how that informs our ticket sales decisions, and how Live Analytics impacts that and give you a case study. Um, but before I get too far into the detail, I kind of want to back up and give you a little bit of a broad overview of what we're doing within the organization um, that kind of informs everything else that we do. So over the last few years, we've, we've recognized throughout our entire organization that uh, we have problems with a lot of data uh, and a lot of lack of people being able to access that, that data. Uh, we don't have it in very usable formats. Um, we don't have it in platforms that people can access and ask questions. Um, you know, we have a lot of different systems. Um, and you know, from our, our ticketing systems, CRM systems, fan loyalty systems, concessions, merchandise, all these different types of things. And it's very clunky for us to try to share data. We're very dependent upon asking each other for information and then waiting for somebody to fill out a report or create a spreadsheet and send that. So what we recognized is that we needed to build tools that were going to be useful throughout the entire organization. And thus, where that impacts here is that anything that we decide to do with CRM or ticket sales or strategy needs to fit within a framework that incorporates the entire organization. We're not going to work within a silo and just do a project only related to CRM and live analytics, for example. We're going to use a, a tool that uh, incorporates the entire organization. So then what we do is we stop and say, OK, what are our, what are our sales as it relates to ticket sales specifically? Um, and some of the things that we want to be able to do is we want to have a better 360 picture of our customers. I think a lot of people talk about having better 360 pictures of their customers. Um, but even just from a very specific ticket sales and CRM perspective, um, the data drops we've been had done in the past where we're bringing information into our CRM seemed like it was useful in the short term. Uh, but when you look back and say, what was this customer doing three or four years ago? It was, you know, a very large amount of data and oftentimes difficult for, say, a CRM analyst that's not you know, in that world every day and doesn't understand the code to be able to figure things out and go ask new questions. And it wasn't something that people outside of the ticket sales world could easily dive into. Um, we want to use, we want to be smart as it relates to analytics, utilizing uh, you know, prospect model, understanding people's demographics. And what we really want to create is a 12-month lead strategy so that we know exactly what we want our sales team to do every single month and who we think we're going after as our best potential customers every single month. Um, so we need to create, you know, we need to create meaning. I think, uh, you know, there's, it, it's very difficult, I think, sometimes to really understand more than what's just there in the raw form. We need to put it in a way that's very useful for people to be able to dive in and be able to get the information at the kind of right level of abstraction, whether that be all the way down to the very granular level of a code, all the way up to kind of higher levels of more broad views that people might look for. Um, and lastly, from a ticket sales perspective, we want to make sure that we're using that organizational structure and the, t and the technology we're developing as the core structure that we're utilizing when we talk about CRM and ticket sales. And then we also want to utilize what we think is a very powerful consumer-based tool, which is our CRM system. So what we started with was uh, really a, a business intelligence BI project where we are bringing many systems into a data warehouse. Uh, and in that data warehouse, ensuring that everything has its appropriate level of meaning and historical value. Um, so the, the crux of that project at this point is really focused on the ticket system. And it does seem like ticketing data is a little more complex than what it would seem. I think sometimes we, we had a BI, we've had BI developers work on this, uh, consultants work to help with this. I think it seems a little bit more like you sell a ticket, it's either kind of on or it's off, but understanding there's a lot of movement, a lot of moving parts, uh, it's been a long process. 
Um, so we, we now have that data housed in Data Warehouse. It has the appropriate meaning and the historical value. And now we need to put it into different tools, which we'll jump into next in terms of how do people now get to this data. And then that, those tools can be spread throughout the entire organization, whether it be to our senior executive team, our marketing team, our ticket sales team, or our CRM analysts. So here's some of the analytical tools that we've rolled out and what, we're, what you know, is some in progress and some future progress. Um, on the top right example is just an example of us using our BI pivot table, our BI cube uh, through pivot tables in Excel as a quick way to access data. You can just see with some sample 2012 data, there's specific levels of meaning. We can you know, identify things as single game tickets, discount tickets. Most every single ticket code, if you're familiar with how things are coming out of ticket systems, probably then ultimately have maybe five different levels of definition, all the way down to the code, to the type of offer that it was, and then specifically back up so people can easily look year over year. And right now we have uh, four years of data housed that's live and updated on an hourly basis through our Ticketmaster feeds. Uh, employee dashboards, we've used our existing da intranet structure, which has been run through SharePoint in the past, to build uh, high level, mostly we've just built high level views that's good for the company everywhere, so people can easily just see what the attendance is for the next two weeks. They don't have to ask for that information. It can just be updated in a live way. Um, moving to the third point there, what we're ultimately gonna do is partner with a, a third party to put that power in people like my hands rather than relying on maybe our IT staff that's more trained in SharePoint. Um, so we'll have tools where we can become power users, build dashboards, build reports, um, so that it's a little bit more robust than maybe what we can get out of Excel. Um, the nice thing, just by the way, in the Excel piece is that I can create things now, send them to somebody, so maybe it's still the first step of what we've done in the past, where we build it in Excel and then email it to somebody, but now they've had that, they can just open that and refresh that, and that always stays in a live form. So those kind of top three are then really what is the complete organization of RBI project and bringing in lots of different data from lots of different sources and making sure that people have access to be able to ask important questions, things they probably wouldn't think to ask or maybe just don't feel like they have time to get the answers on because now they have the information in front of them. Moving now more specifically to the CRM side, we do think that the CRM and the ticket process is going to be a place where that can be our consumer-based tool where we can identify through the data that we have more and have a better understanding of who our customers are. So what we've done, just kind of quickly through this, is we've integrated that data. So rather than just dropping ticket data right from our ticket system to our CRM through the data warehouse with the correct meaning, focused on the concepts of utility and understanding. I want our CRM analysts to be able to go back over three years and identify you know, what types of tickets people have bought. Have they been StubHub buyers? Have they been single game ticket buyers, group buyers, mini plan buyers? And maybe that will help us when we're looking, say, what are people more likely to buy the year after we win our division? They can, we can go back to 2008 and see what people mostly bought in 2008 easier than if we just tried to initiate reports like that out of our ticket system. Um, we want to bring in additional systems. Uh, so some obvious points of, uh, of uh, information we'll bring in. You know, we have lots of information that come in from our online partners at MLBAM. Uh, we know their open rates and click rates. Uh, we have loaded ticket information that ties back to barcodes, to people, uh, that tell us what concessions they're purchasing, at what times, at what stands. Um, and fan, fan loyalty is another kind of obvious place. Anything that is very customer centric, we want that information to end up in this location in a way that it's easy for us to sort and identify what they're doing. Um, we've hired an, an extra analyst in the last year. Uh, it had just been myself and one CRM analyst. We've brought in a second analyst. Um, and what's really been cool about that is we, we've done it for two reasons. One is we need one person to focus on some of this high level strategic planning, long term integrations and some of the you know, bigger things than the day-to-day. -day. So our new analysts, we let just say, focus completely on the day-to-day -day aspects of uh, managing the lead process, managing the sales pr process, and working with our sales reps. And they've really become um, informed in a way that I wouldn't have thought by just having access to everything in a very quick way. So as we kind of transition towards live analytics, which is on the bottom of that slide, and bringing in the prospect models and bringing in people's demographic histories and looking at what other types of tickets they've bought, our CRM analysts are having a very easy time looking for patterns of what's working and what's not because that information is there in one system that they're very comfortable being able to access that data. So we, um, 
through the live analytics process, one of the things we're trying to do is identify who are the best customers that are potentially going to buy whatever type of ticket plans from full seasons down to very small ticket plans, and how do we go about trying to turn those, those people into cust customers. In most cases, what we're doing is working with current ticket buyers. They've consumed something from us, but we want them to in increase their spend or come to more games. Um, so, you know, in sports, and in, in every sport, we, can't, we don't have the same tools 12 months of the year to sell. For us in baseball, selling in April, May, or sorry, January, February, and March is very different than selling in November and December or in, April, in May, June, or July. So what we want to do is make sure we're taking a look at who are our best customers, where are they, what can we learn about them, and then how does that inform the strategy of when we want to roll out actual leads to our sales reps at what time of the year. So I'll just show you kind of some quick information that we got back as examples from live analytics. And so here is just, you know, there are, there are many different metrics that we got back, but I just kind of picked four. And from these four, what we, what we can see here is maybe what looks like a full season ticket potential buyer. And so on the top left, we have the discretionary income. Um, one thing we had been relying on with past information we'd had when we'd uh, identified our customers is household income. And through the live analytics uh, process, we got their discretionary income. Well, what we didn't know or didn't think about until we had that around us is that a, a pretty big portion of our, our core season, full season ticket base are actually retired or maybe independently wealthy. So when you're looking at household incomes, they don't look like they have a salary but they do actually have a lot of discretionary income. And as you can see, our full season ticket holders look significantly different than every other type of buyer that we have. And in this case, the other buyers all look relatively similar. Um, you can see in the bottom left, the personics clusters, the lifestyle clusters, uh, the data we get. Um, one of the most fun parts about it is seeing the 500 different ways that we get categorized in this world. Uh, but you can see in the bottom, bottom category for full season ticket holders there, we have you know, a very wealthy, and I can't read from here, but I believe it's established wealth, and uh, one other one, but it's the two to the left are the largest uh, groups. So again, it, it kind of supports this idea that we have people that are very wealthy and often retired as our full season ticket holders. The top right kind of is something we've also known to a certain extent, but when it, the part of it is that we put this information around us and put it together in a way that's helped us paint new pictures. So distance to the ballpark is extremely important. You can see from the, the left, the darkest column is the how close they are. That's the 10 miles within. And you can see that angle kind of rolls directly from the single game buyer being mostly the farthest away and the full season ticket holder being the closest. That's a particular challenge for us in the Phoenix market where the majority of people in Phoenix live in the suburban areas. I would say between 10 and 20 miles away from our ballpark. So now we need to find older, wealthy people within 10 miles of our ballpark look like the profile of our full season ticket holders. And then lastly, in the bottom right, you see the type of data that we can only get from Ticketmaster. What are they purchasing per event at other Ticketmaster events in our market? And so again, you can see that there's a group of people that are more likely to spend more dollars. Um, what Ticketmaster does for us is ultimately grades these people in terms of their likelihood to spend number of games and their likelihood to spend number of dollars per ticket. And so we try to judge it based on who looks like maybe more of a premium seat holder but for a couple games, or somebody that maybe looks like maybe a less expensive ticket holder for a lot of games. What we find with these particular four factors is that there's a very specific profile that looks like a full season ticket holder and that those are people that we need to make sure in our lead process we're reaching out to in the January, February, and March timeframe. What's less clear is what does a half season ticket holder or a third season holder look like compared to others? And that's where the value of the you know, 50 other, 60 other uh, pieces of data we have and putting those in the hand of our two CRM analysts, they've been able to find things. They're finding that Personics cluster looks a little bit more significant. They're finding that the likelihood to spend on dollars is more important than the likelihood to spend on games. Because frankly, what we're trying to do in the ticket sales world is take people that come to one game and turn them into a half season plan holder. So it doesn't necessarily seem to correlate quite as well as the dollars per ticket. So we're learning a lot. We're putting this information in front of people. We're putting it in formats that people are able to ask questions and be able to go in and find this. And you know, I think for our 2013 campaign, results are probably still to be determined as we're into March. But we certainly definitely have a sense that we're working smarter and more efficiently than we have in the past. And we're putting better leads in our reps at the right period of time. So ultimately, the results is CRM, we think, can be our ultimate tool for everything consumer-based. 
Um, it's improved our understanding of market and provided us opportunities we think that we see for growth. Uh, we do have direct link between what we're seeing from live analytics and the strategy we're rolling out. Um, we ultimately also are kind of completely forming our entire marketing strategy based off a lot of this information. And we have what we think is a pretty solid 12 month plan for what we want our sales reps to be productive year round and ultimately you know, the goal of selling more and being more productive. So I'm gonna pass it over to Anthony and he can talk a little bit about his experience at the Magic. Thank you, sir. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to fly through some of this because I'm hoping that we can have time for, uh, for some questions. Um, Anthony Perez, I'm Vice President of Business Strategy with the Magic. Our group is really a centralized uh, strategy and analytics resource for our entire organization. So we look at a, a number of different things two of which I want to talk about today as it relates to live analytics. One, um, a case study on single game yield management and how we're utilizing uh, specifically the price master tool um, to help us with that process. And then also how we're using live analytics data. So a lot of the same things that you just heard about happening in Arizona, some of those things that we're doing, uh, both with some of the services we're getting from live analytics as well as using some of that data. So a great question that came up over the summer, we traded Dwight Howard and where, does, and where business sort of intersects with basketball, what does it mean for us in terms of selling tickets? first question that everybody wanted to know on the business side. And so uh, we tried to do some analysis. We got some data from the NBA, really looking at across all of the NBA markets, utilizing secondary market data. Um, what did we see in terms of average resale prices and how those were impacted by you know, obvious change, uh, differences in market sizes and things like that, but then also team factors, whether they had a superstar player, whether they were a playoff team. And that sort of initial analysis over the summer to try to understand magnitude. Uh, implied to us when we started changing the factors uh, assumed for our team, so no superstar, potentially not being a playoff team, we projected a drop in the average resale price of anywhere between 30 and 35 percent, which to us was, gave us an indication about what to potentially expect in terms of demand. As it stands today, uh, we're down 28 percent in terms of average resale price compared to last year. Um, and so it, it gives you a sense for that impact is real and it's been there. Now how did we handle it from the business side? We had an understanding of what we thought could happen and then we tried to lay out a plan for how do we mitigate it. Um, this gives you a little bit of that background. We've got 22 price levels in our building. We spend a lot of time uh, internally during the off season developing regression models to understand manifest scaling. We're under the, uh, in the process right now of using three years worth of secondary market data to really make sure that we have optimized our manifest scaling as best we can. We use variable pricing. We've got seven tiers. Um, we have a demand model that we utilize for that. Uh, we variably price our season tickets to give us as much flexibility as we possibly can during the season. And as much work as we do to price our games as best we can before the season starts, that's really not good enough. Uh, factors can change. A lot of different things can happen uh, unexpectedly um, or otherwise. And so ultimately, we, uh, we dynamically price as well. And that's where we utilize Price Master. <clears throat> so this just gives you a screenshot of the interface that we use. We're in this every day. We're very aggressive about it. We make sure that we are maximizing revenue at every opportunity. And it's really interesting, particularly given what John said, because our goal is maximizing revenue. We have unsold tickets. And so our goal is not to sell out games necessarily. <clears throat> we're trying to make as much money as we can. And uh, this is a great tool that we use, and we're in it every day. So let's talk about results. <clears throat> this is about a week old, <clears throat> but going back, 30, 31 home games. When we had played 31 home games, I want to give you a comparison. It's tough to compare back to last year. Lockout shortened. We didn't start until Christmas. So I'm going to go back to the 2010-11 season to just give you some comparisons. So we'll start with just team factors. Uh, we had a much better record at the time, um, and you can see our weighted average tiers. Again, we have seven tiers, and this is just to kind of show whether there was differences in the schedule. Some of these comparisons, it's not like we, play, we played the Lakers and the Heat and all these great teams already this year, and last year we hadn't played them until the end of the year. So that's why I want to use weighted average tier as a comparison point. But this just gives you kind of a visual of what our revenue was that year. You look at this year through 31 home games, our overall, schedule, our overall record, 15 and 38, our weighted average tier, uh, basically the same, maybe played one or two of sort of higher uh, tier games at this point in the 10-11 season. But you can see a huge contrast in team performance, which, which definitely has had an impact on uh, demand for our tickets. But when you actually do a revenue comparison, we're not that far off. We're down 6.3%, which um, on its face looks pretty good. We're very happy with that. 
taking it one step further, the 2010-11 season was the opening season for Amway Center, so, uh, <clears throat> which is currently the Sports Business Journal's facility of the year. Great facility, I think that's also been a mitigating factor for us in terms of driving a great fan experience, even if the product on the court isn't what um, it, people have, have been used to over the past several years. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the important thing here is that when you look at, when you think about preseason, preseason in the 10-11 uh, season was a sales bonanza. I mean, we sold out every preseason game like we'd never seen before. Even coming off our NBA Finals appearance, we didn't sell out preseason games the following year. But we did this season. There were low-rated games, very affordable, and in the research that we were doing in terms of surveying single-game buyers, after the fact, it was all about seeing Amway Center. It was people's opportunity to use a cheap price point to get in the building and see what it was all about. So it's somewhat of an anomaly when you think about just our historical uh, performance. Preseason has never performed to this level, and, uh, and it may not for a while until we, until we renovate or build a new building. Um, so when we take out preseason, we're down 3.3%. So you really start to look at, we're very close to flat, and we still think that we have a chance in terms of looking at uh, games that we still have upcoming, uh, how those games have sold so far. We believe that we can potentially achieve uh, completely flat, if not exceed what we did in the 10-11 season in terms of single game revenue. And that is in huge part to the fact that every day we are aggressively managing yield and making sure that we're squeezing every dollar that we can out of the building. Again, not necessarily meaning that we're selling out the game, but maximizing dollars. And, uh, and Price Master is a big part of that. So another business question that I just want to touch on in terms of how we use live analytics is how we can better target the right prospects with the right products. We're always thinking about you know, the days of emailing 50,000 people in our customer database and just saying who's interested in this product and seeing sort of who bites it, it's over. You know, we've got to really treat uh, our touch points with customers or prospects as scarce resources. And so we want to get it right at the, on the front end in terms of who we're going out to with different products and, uh, and when we're doing that. And so we've used live analytics to help us with that, developing a prospect model similar to what's going on in Arizona. You can see some of the data points tested there. Uh, the stuff on the top, the demographic, psychographic, lifestyle, you know, to, to be frank, you can get that from a lot of different vendors, and, and we recognize that. I think the differentiating factor for us with live analytics is this next set of information that you can't get anywhere, and that's just live event data. And it's been very valuable in terms of the work that uh, live analytics has done for us in prospect modeling, but also some of the things that we've done ourselves. Being able to understand uh, the makeup of what other people, what our customers or prospects are doing outside of our building. We don't operate Amway Center, and so we don't really get a lot of the concert information. We've got a rival down the street in Tampa with the St. Pete Times Forum that we're always competing for with great concerts, so we get a lot of customers that are going down there to see whatever show is coming to Tampa and may not be coming here and vice versa. And so getting that sort of full picture of our customers' preferences in terms of live events has made a big difference, and, and we saw that as a huge competitive advantage for live analytics and utilizing their data uh, services. This is the same kind of thing that, that Kenny was showing. I mean, you can see some of the variation um, across full, partial, and single game buyers. It, it gives you a sense for what the makeup of those types of, uh, of purchasers look like, um, just, to, just to sort of illustrate. I won't hit on, on too much here other than to say, you know, some of these variables, again, we've got uh, outputs from live analytics talking about the quality of leads, whether they're, they're likely to to be a, a full season buyer or, or a partial plan buyer, but we also use some of the individual data points that we're getting to try to enhance that um, with some of the things that we do internally. And, and here's some examples of that. So full partial seasons, we've, we've got that covered. Live Analytics does a great job on that. We've tried to take some of that data and look at, at things like targeting club seat buyers. So club seats, same price point as some of our lower bowl uh, sections. So how do we sort of differentiate if, if, if buyers look different for club seats? Than, uh, than, than our lower bowl seats. And we found that they actually do look different, and some of that is the live event information that we're getting. Some of those propensity scores factor into that. Upgrades, looking at so our top spending season ticket accounts and understanding not only who's out there in terms of lists of, uh, 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 in our database that look that way to target. In this case, we've launched a campaign for premium flex plans where it's been very successful utilizing our upgrade model, but then also looking at our existing season ticket holders. You know, who looks like they could spend a lot more than what they're spending, and why is that? And let's, let's work on a strategy to try to target those people, give them the better experience that costs more money, and ultimately convert them into that. And we're in the process with that right now in our renewals. And then another great example is Family Day. So every Sunday is Family Day at the Magic. You get a ticket, uh, a hot dog, or, or a hamburger, and a Pepsi. And what we started to look at was what looks different between the people who are buying the Family Day seats 
um, in those various locations versus the people who are buying seats in similar locations for the same games but not buying the Family Day seats. And we found some really interesting uh, differences there, um, one of which is just uh, distance from how far, you know, how far they live from the building. Uh, typically, we're seeing sort of our, our single game buyers that aren't buying packages like this, interestingly enough, are, uh, are, are much more local. And so um, you can infer from that, you know, people, it's, they're making an event out of it. It's a, it's a family event, and they're going to come from, you know, Melbourne or some of these, these, uh, these outer areas of central Florida. But again, you know, utilizing uh, the things that we're getting from live analytics and then ultimately leveraging some of the data that we get from them as enhancements, enhancements on top of that uh, to better target customers. So just a, a small sampling of some of the things that we're doing um, to better target uh, prospects. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to John for if we've got time for questions, I don't know. Thanks, Anthony. So I know we started pretty late. Um, do we have time for a little bit of Q&A? Okay, so um, I just want to thank uh, Kenny and Anthony again for uh, coming out. It's always nice to have clients that can talk about how they're really using the data. And uh, with that, I guess we'll open it up if there are any other questions. We don't have any. I mean, yeah. we're not. There's no. There's not any way our baseball ops said would decide on a decision on a player or a trade based on what they might sell. They're going to try to make the best decision to. No, I mean, how do you react to what they do? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that we have. I don't know if 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 regardless of all fluctuation on the field and regardless of team performance and ensure that we can maximize when that's the best and that we you know, still maintain uh, while we're maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say you know, we, try, we try as best we can to sort of pinpoint the impact of those things. I mean, Dwight was a great example. We wanted to understand you know, what was sort of the, what was going to be the macro effect and, um, and try to prepare for that early. Uh, but, you know, another great example, I'm, I'm speaking on the competitive advantage panel tomorrow and I'm going to talk about retention. And one of the things that we just dealt with was trading J.J. Redick. You know, he's one of the few players left of a team that everybody was, uh, was, was in love with over the last you know, seven years or, or whatever it may be. And, and he was a fan favorite. And so understanding, um, we set up some processes knowing that it was a possibility that he could be traded. We set, up, uh, we set ourselves up to be able to track the impact in CRM to understand you know, who, uh, who potentially was feeling negatively affected in, in terms of their ultimate decision to renew with us, and then utilizing that information to target those people with uh, events around team direction. So maybe they needed an opportunity to come to an event uh, on a game night where somebody from our basketball operations staff would kind of talk to them about, um, or talk to a, a group of our customers about you know, their view of, of team direction and, um, and sort of what they liked about the players that we got, that sort of thing. So I think that's, the, that's about the best we can do. I, I agree with Kenny. We don't get a lot of we don't really get a heads up. It's, it's more of just you know, trying to make sure that we're prepared for whatever may happen. Well, I think in the case of single game, uh, yield, you know, it's a, a big part of it is I think that we did because we saw the impact or what we thought was going to be the impact in terms of uh, in, in terms of prices being depressed and ultimately, you know, demand really dropping. We tried to do as much as we could in preparation for that in terms of making changes to uh, to season ticket prices even last year going into this season and, and setting ourselves up as best we could in terms of that positioning. Um, as much as I think that all the work that we do to get the scaling right and the variable prices right, you know, which is really, you know, it's funny, now that we're just full-blown dynamic, I mean, the, the variable pricing piece of it is just, you know, what's the best starting point? You know, we don't want to leave money on the table on day one when people, when we first go on sale and we start seeing a lot of tickets move, but I think the dynamic piece of it has been really important. The way it's affected our business now is it's really hard to communicate to people, you know, what's our, what's our gate price? You know, it's in, in the past, it's sort of been like you set a gate price and, and you just you ride that out through the season. Now, you know our gate price for for a certain game could change 
you know, 20 times over the course of the year. And so, you know, how do we, how do we best communicate with our customers the, the value that they're getting for maybe purchasing a full season plan as opposed to, as opposed to a single game? But I, so I think, it's a, I think it's a variety of things, but I think the, the dynamic piece of it has been, has been big for us. Um, how do you dis how much of this information do you push through in a visible manner to your end users on your sales team and your CRM? How do you decide what pieces of it to expose to them to help them customize their sales pitches? Is it something you've tested and seen different success with? It's something we I think is still ongoing. Um, what we decided to do was share the information with our senior sales reps and trust that they kind of have the maturity to you know know how to use that information properly. I think we, you know, what the fear is is that you don't want them, A, being selective on only choosing what they think are the good ones, and you also want them to go through the process that we're training them. We want to you know, push towards a larger package and then you know, talk that back as we go through the sales process. Um, so we've made the decision not to really, to keep that as much as possible from our junior sales staff and more of our newer reps so that they can just kind of focus on what they're learning how to do and learning how to be sales reps and not get too bogged down with the too much information that is going to take them off their script. Yeah, it's, I'd say the same thing for us. I mean, we, we deal with, uh, you, we have a lot of those questions of now that we've got a ton of data, I mean, how do we make sure that uh, we're making it actionable to, you know, our, our frontline staff? And so we spend a lot of time trying to think through how is this, how is this actionable to, uh, to a salesperson or a service person? Um, so it, it, it's challenging. I think we've done a lot in terms of our sort of process. We, we uh, similar to Kenny, we've got a data warehouse where we're sort of putting everything, and then ultimately, you know, what ult what ends up in CRM uh, is, in some cases, we're not pushing things into CRM, or we may be aggregating or summarizing, and those sorts of things to make it a little bit more uh, more user friendly. So it sounds like one last one. Um, go ahead. Uh, and question about dynamic pricing. So in practice, it really looks like it's flexing up. What happens when the data says lower prices? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, we don't always go up, even though in, in most cases we do. Uh, there are cases where we go down. It is a delicate balance um, in terms of wanting to maintain value for season ticket holders and, and kind of showing them. And, and here's where the challenge is. You know, just because we say that we're not going to sell a ticket for uh, you know, less than what they paid for, it doesn't mean that other people are, are ultimately paying less than what they did on the secondary market. So it is a challenge. I think where, where we've tried to go in terms of a strategy is we avoid as much as we can going below season ticket prices. And I would submit that we don't ever go below. Uh, that being said, I think what we've tried to, to change the focus for our season ticket holders is not so much about whether we're selling a ticket for more or less than what they may have paid for a single game, but that in the totality of the season that they will get the best value. And you know, it's, it's a mindset change, but that's been our message, is that overall, uh, you will get the best value, and, and that's where we sort of spend a lot of time sort of focusing them. It doesn't mean that they don't look at a particular game and say, man, you know, this one's selling for a lot less, but we try to do everything we can to arm our service team and even our sales team with that type of information to say, look, it, it, it has, you have gotten the best value from sort of being a bulk purchaser, so that's how we look at it. So I think we're out of time. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate getting your time for the last hour. Um, We'll be here, and I think all three of us are at the whole conference, so find us if you have any other questions. <laughs>